You had posted on LinkedIn recently. What does one do when the thing you've been working on for a decade hmm. suddenly proves valuable in ways that are different from what anyone imagined? I guess in many ways, this comes back to the idea that success can come from you know chance as much as hard work and preparation and anticipation. And so it's like, all right, we've just fallen into the right place through definitely through deliberate effort, but not anticipating the application. So that's hmm. been really fun. So you've, you've seen quote unquote generational tectonic shifts in technology. What's your suspicion on what's different this time? I, I guess the consensus on the street is, you know, so he basically said, if you give me the choice between giving me all the data in the world about you and giving me uh, data about your friends of friends of friends, people you never, by definition, you don't know, in order for me to make a prediction, I will always choose the latter, which is pretty mind blowing pieces of advice I often have for uh, aspiring PMs whose role is like being the CEO of the product. Well, you're also the janitor of the product. I mean, your job mm. is to, for that product to be successful, whatever it takes. People across different domains, different industries, different kinds of problems realizing, oh, hey, you know, I've already got this data. It's actually connected. If I put it into a graph database, then I can suddenly use it in all kinds of ways that previously weren't possible. And I can start to see these causes and effects and, you know, predictive patterns. But we've sort of had our own version of that, which is graphs are eating the world. You were saying graphs end up using fewer tokens and we're all trying to be uh, stingy on, on the number of tokens that we use, both in and probably out. And with Neo4j, you can get somewhere around like 2 million pointer chasing operations per second, which is pretty darn fast and, and also very compute efficient. So you usually don't need tons and tons of hardware to, to get this stuff done. On episode 16 of the AI Portfolio podcast, we have Philip Rathley, the Chief Technology Officer of Neo4j, the popular graph database company, which is now taken off by storm because of GraphRag, a new approach for making LLM retrieval augmented generation applications more accurate by leveraging graphs. So you know today is going to be all about GraphRag and its impact on the market. Philip, you've been at Neo4j for over 12 years now. I think I looked it up. And yeah, you've seen, you know, like you've seen graphs play a critical role in the data infrastructure market over that time. Is this just a resurgence of graph technology and, and what's different about this, this Gen AI era? Yeah, so I guess I've been doing this like for an eternity by Silicon Valley standards. Um, but what's uh, actually what's kept me doing it for so long is that it's not just an approach, it's a mindset, and it's not just one thing. It's a variety of things, like including a database management system, but also like all kinds of tooling and visualization and different algorithms and operational, but also analytic, you know, and data and inside of analytic is like data science, but also um, you know, kind of more global pattern matching kinds of activities. So there's a lot packed into there. But as to your question, yeah, there's absolutely no doubt that. No, nobody foresaw, or certainly I didn't foresee, the way AI and Gen AI would actually manifest and finally take off. Um, nor did we foresee that graphs would actually play a pretty key role in um, breaking past what many people are encountering now, which is uh, you've got this great prototype and it's promising and there are all this stuff you want to do, but then um, other techniques aren't just good and good enough to get you there. And it turns out that um, graphs can help in a number of ways, and GraphRag is the biggest one. When did GraphRag start to really get popular? I, it really got popular. So I started seeing it maybe a year, year and a half ago with oh, wow. our customers. And okay. these ten, so in the earliest days, it was people who already had their data in a graph. And you know, what kind of data do you, do you have in a graph? Well, primarily it was the part of the world model that they were uh, you know, capturing for their business. So that reflection of that, you could say that's a, always a digital twin in some form that that term is, you know, can be used in a bunch of ways. Um, and th them actually having the knowledge and the tool and then applying it to this other cool stuff they were trying to do. Um, where it became popularized was this uh, Microsoft GraphRag uh, report, like the Microsoft research did this really cool paper and they used the term GraphRag, which we hadn't yet begun doing. We figured, you know, early days, you don't know whether, you know, how big something is going to be. And, the, you know, I always hesitate to create new jargon and new terminology unless it's really 
necessary and clarifying. But then, you know, after Microsoft released their paper, that started getting a lot of interest and reads and then shed a light on what we and our customers and user community were doing. Um, and then from then on, it's kind of been graph rag all the way. That was, I want to say April this year, but honestly, it's all a blur. Like every week there's something new, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, I asked some interesting questions around multimodal because right now we're still in mm-hmm. LLM yeah. rag. And so that'll be an interesting discussion when we come to that. Um, and agents. Are, and agents. Yes. I also have that on the docket. Uh, what are you seeing as top use cases? More general in Gen AI, because I, I know there's a big hype cycle talk and et cetera, et cetera. What are you seeing with your clients, you know, taking traction with Gen AI? Yeah. So I guess let me talk about use cases in two ways. One is more like horizontal terms in terms of like patterns. Um, and another way is maybe more generally in terms of business application. Um, and I'll start by saying that I think everyone's trying to throw this stuff at lots of different business applications. So it's, it's very horizontal from that perspective. Um, the, you know, the ones that seem to be getting traction first seem to be ones where you have some level of appetite for, uh, errors, uh, on the part of the gen AI stack. Um, and where there's, some tolerance in terms of opacity, you know, slash lack of transparency. Um, and so those are kind of the easier ones. Those also tend to be the, maybe the less valuable ones and the ones that are easier to, to practice with. Um, and so those tend to be more, you've got like a chat interface, uh, the employee is the end user because the employee then will either use it for their internal jobs or as part of engaging with a customer but then the you know the buck stops with the knowledgeable human who can you know decide not to pass along the hallucination and apply their own reasoning um so that's probably you know i think probably everyone listening will probably agree like that's what they're seeing as well um now as we all try to do better than that and raise the bar and get in, get into higher stakes kind of use cases where a, a wrong answer can lead to um, higher dollar value outcomes, which is why we want to do them. But then if it backfires, you might have, you know, either you mess up the higher dollar uh, opportunity and you lose it or you piss off a customer and, you know, that then you've really lost the opportunity or ran in reputational impact or anything to do with human fairness, bias or health and human safety. Uh, And then you have regulation that also often comes in. And even if you don't have most of those, um, when in cases where you're unleashing, like you know, some kind of agent uh, uh, to do a particular thing, and that thing has some probabilistic element to it and lack of explainability, then the you end up needing a human being. Uh, some human being will be the throat that gets choked um, if things go wrong, and then that person, uh, hopefully, they have some stake. And some say in deciding whether, you know, and whether and to what extent the application gets rolled out. And then as part of allowing it to be rolled out, oftentimes they want to understand the why, like, why is this decision getting made? Um, so that, I guess, maybe I'm going a step farther than your question, identifying some of the gaps, but those gaps are really what lead people to try GraphRag quite often. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's, Hey, my domain's a graph, like it's a supply chain or it's a computer network or it's a social network. Or, you know, oftentimes a lot of the data that, that we're used to dealing with in the real world, if you go scribble it on a whiteboard, it shows up as a network and as a graph. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of us has been trained to think in tables or in documents or in key values. So sometimes that's the reflex, but sometimes for people who, you know, have used uh, a product like Neo4j in the past, or you know, another graph database, you um, tend to see those things as graphs, and like, okay, I'm going to put it in a graph. Um, and then the, the other way people come at it is, all right, I've tried a bunch of other stuff. Oh, I've heard about this graph rag thing. Let me try it out. And that's where 
you um, potentially unlock one or more of these other benefits, depending on how you use it, um, of more, not just more accurate results, but more useful, comprehensive, rich, however you want to say it, um, as well as uh, more explainability, more, you know, a kind of a choice of a sliding scale to go, go between determinism and uh, stochastic kinds of approaches. And I'm all for sto stochastic, but hey, if you've got a technology and a data set that's able to give you an exact answer, then, you know, hey, give me the exact answer. And oftentimes that's also like, you know, more definitely 100% accuracy, 100% explainability, uh, cheaper, less latent. You know, there's a lot to that, even though it seems archaic and not, you know, not cool these days. Um, so it's it's a combination of those things, and the uh, and I could, if you want, get into patterns, but you know, I've I've talked about it a lot. So <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll I'll come to that yeah. soon. Um, so one thing that you just piqued my interest. So supply chain as as a graph, and a lot of people, I think, as we look at um, so I work in retail, so a lot of folks, yeah, and I think there's there's tons of supply chain applications around the world. Optimizing that supply chain and having supply chain visibility. I'm, you know, you're seeing lots of folks request, "Hey, I want to be able to do Gen AI in supply chain." What are you seeing being done with Gen AI in supply chain currently? Um, so let me first set the stage and talk about how graphs fit into supply chain. Sweet. Um, okay. and the kinds of calculations because you have. The, the movement of goods um, and then is, is one thing. And then you also have this uh, composition or let's say bill of materials of a product that includes all these other products. So that's um, the graph of, you know, I mean, really that's a pretty straight hierarchy of what, you know, an airplane has a million parts. Several airplane manufacturers happen to use Neo4j for this. It's like, the, the main part, which is the airplane and the model and make, so on, serial number, and then all the way on down to parts, parts of parts, parts of parts. But then those each come from different place, places, have their suppliers, and then there's this whole other part to it, which is the movement of, um, of goods. So this is like two hierarchies which are connected together, which makes it more than just a simple hierarchy. And the kinds of calculations you tend to want to do are... I, I want to hedge my risk against different suppliers. So this is like a form of economic risk or diversification, or I want to hedge my risk across different geographies uh, in anticipation of different, you know, we were just talking about how you've got a hurricane headed your way. Um, you know, there, there are certainly a lot of environmental, you know, you have ships that get stuck in <laughs> key canals, which, uh, you know, we saw a few years ago with the Evergrande um, ship um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, and then a lot of, you know, kind of repatriation of supply chain and that kind of thing. Uh, those calculations tend to be multi-level, um, deterministic and involve math. And it's not super complex math. It's pretty basic math, but it's math. And these are all things that are, uh, you know, handled really well uh, in a graph database. It's like multi-level hops with math. It's kind of bread and butter uh, in the sweet spot of what the technology can do. A lot of, you can do it in SQL databases, but it gets really painful. Like, you know, and you, you talked about retail, like you also have on top of it, promotions and inventory. And we have some retail customers who just do their promotions calculation in Neo4j because that's 20 levels plus deep if you consider the time period and the region and the category and all these other things that fit into calculating, you know, bundles, weather, um, things, uh, uh, how a promotion should be applied. So you tend to have a lot of use cases with these intersecting multi-level kinds of things where, like I said, you can do it in relational, but it grinds a lot of iron inefficiently to get a slow result when by contrast, you could actually uh, write the query more easily, get a faster result and do it on a lot less hardware with, with a graph database. So 
now let's look at LLMs, like multi-level determinism with math is nowhere near the sweet spot of what an LM can do, right? Um, this is why we have agentic systems is there are parts, some calculations that maybe might be best handled by that agent, but the agent might just run a query against something like Neo4j and um, get your calculation and then hand it back to some other part of the process where there's something like composing that result into an email for a particular audience. That's the sweet spot of LLM. So the um, the, the the cases where I've seen supply chain come up, and it's it's probably not the top use case uh, okay. that I've seen so far with LLMs, um, but it's been I want to democratize supply chain risk by giving people the ability to ask arbitrary questions. Um, you ask the question in the graph, but then. The, the the translation of the question into a query and the translation of the results back into an answer, uh, both textual and then your know, visualization is kind of a different part of it, but sometimes sometimes comes along for the ride. That that's that's a way those two technologies are used together. So that's a good example of uh, the kind of graph rag pattern where the um, decision making is vested on the graph side of things because it happens to be deterministic. And the LLM um, does everything around it. Um, of course, you yeah. Of course, you can. All, you've also got cases where it's some some mix thereof, right? Yep. So before we, we probably get too ahead of ourselves, we, we're saying graph a lot, and, and just to sort of respect the audience. Um, can you break down? Can you really start with what is a graph, and then what are the different types of graphs that you see in enterprise? Yes. Um, so I, I guess some people unfamiliar with graphs will relate it back to graph theory and what they you know, might have learned in school. Um, and while graph theory is super relevant and interesting to this field, it's not really what got us started. It's more something that, you know, kind of it's, it's, it's very much a practical invention and practice and, and not something that came out of anything highly theoretical or that one needs to be theoretically educated to, to put into practice. And the, the initial idea was a lot of the world shows up in networks, including hierarchies. And then a lot of enterprise applications end up dealing with one or more networks, one or more hierarchies. And you end up with something that if you ask a um, business person in the company to go, or like probably everyone here you know, has been in some sort of meeting where there's someone from the business and someone from IT present, and you end up drawing on the whiteboard, like in circles and lines, the relationship between whatever customers and whatever they've bought and whatever, you know, uh, or customers and their, how they're insured or supply chains or divisions or so on, like the natural way that we as humans conceptualize uh, a lot of the, a lot of this natural real world data or digital world data is just through circles and lines kind of you know very much the way the brain is structured and the way the brain processes data as it happens um, and so the idea was well it wasn't possible in the days of spinning disk and sparse memory to actually have a database that could perform or get you anywhere um, and be have this kind of structure because the kind of processing that happens, the kind of IO specifically ends up being random and you're hopping all over the place and the computer systems of yours just couldn't handle that. Um, and so part of what drove actually this um, graph database, uh, I won't say renaissance, like the, the, the birth of the category, is this um, look ahead, which now is very much in the present of, we're gonna have ample memory that's gonna be relatively cheap, and we're gonna have IO subsystems that are not spinning disk and uh, where you need to have to just cram data together and so on, but where you actually can just hop around randomly. So the coupling of that kind of architecture to support that kind of workload, um, together with 
a data model that's, that looks a lot like the real world where you can swivel the chair from your whiteboard and take those things and drop them as, in as they are without going through a bunch of like contortions to get them into a different shape, namely tabular with join tables and um, all the rest. That that uh, th- that was really the birth of this from a from a data and database perspective. Then from there, you've actually got several kinds of activities you can carry out. Um, a key one is pattern matching. And for anyone who hasn't checked out the cipher language, which is basically the st- invented but opened by Neo4j and is the the de facto standard for querying graphs, and actually is a straight path to the ISO GQL standard, which came out this April and is um, now a sibling language to SQL um, based on the property graph model that kind of the, the, the root first thing you learn is uh, how to draw patterns. There's a match clause and that match clause as much as possible tries to match um, line up with what you, the, how you visually draw like circles and lines in order to describe a pattern that then you search for. So like searching for patterns is the, the one key kind of activity. And you can do like a Kevin Bacon query in just a couple lines. And you know what's the shortest path between these two things? And then you can constrain it different relationship types and then filter it according to properties and drop in, parachute in with indexes, uh, et cetera. Um, then you've got a whole class of algorithmic kinds of things that you can do, um, graph algorithms, like th- th- these are forms of unsupervised learning where you can say, I'm going to do a bunch of, com- throw a bunch of compute in, in, you know, massively paralyzed, scan across the entire graph and come back with like, how does the natural data naturally group into communities? Like who are the people that call each other most often in a phone network? And just let their behavior sort of reveal the topology. Um, then you can do analysis around what are the key roles um, that exist uh, in relation to those clusters of activity that are emergent. So someone who's at the center might fit like a Maven profile, like they're always talking to everyone. That's that's a really key role to know about. Someone who uniquely connects to different clusters that otherwise aren't communicating. That's another key role. And this. This is key if you're doing marketing or trying to retain customers or trying to, you know, catch bad guys or, uh, and so on and so forth. So lots of different applications. And then you've got some more advanced things like, you know, in graph machine learning, like link prediction, trying to predict where the next uh, relationship is going to form. Um, and, uh, and then things like graph neural networks, which is kind of, kind of another level from it. Uh, but when we talk about GraphRag, it's you have all these at your disposal, I, um, and that's uh, it's, it's a pretty big tool set, um, which can make it a little daunting. But this is where examples and open source and community and sharing and discords can all come in and help. So, how would you describe? So, you you just shared um, that that's actually a quite interesting thing with graphs and memory, and that's kind of why they. They actually started to take off because of the random IO that you were seeing. There's this notion of forming connections between objects. Um, I do like the fact that graphs ground themselves in quote unquote real world objects or things, not mm-hmm. not strings. Because I, you know, LLMs are just a bunch of tokens. Yeah. Hopefully, it's hopefully, great, modeling great reference to Google Knowledge Graph paper. Yes. Um, how would you describe graph rack? From that perspective, most simply, it's doing retrieval augmented generation where somewhere on your query path is a call to a graph database. Okay, and does that call have to be synchronous or can it be asynchronous? Like I send. Uh, I would one? say synchronous because you want that result to then be fed into the LLM. So, like at least synchronous to the point where. Um, before you make the call to the LLM, you include the call to the graph database. Now you might do a graph and a vector call at the same time, mm-hmm. maybe with the same database, maybe with two different uh, DBMSs, um, and uh, potentially those two could be asynchronous. But I- I'd say even in that case, 
you oftentimes uh, can benefit further by combining those two. So like you might want to re-rank your vector results based on some kind of graph calculation like centrality. The graph can help you uh, decide which vectors or which um, things that the vectors are related to are most important and how to how to rank those. So I, I'd, I'd probably weigh in more on the side of synchronous. On, on the synchronous side. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so it does sound like you could use graph neural networks in a graph rag approach. I, I haven't seen anything like that yet. I haven't either. So l let's talk about how you would do that. So, and I guess to do that, maybe for those who aren't familiar with graph neural networks, basically the output of a graph neural network um, operation is it's a vector. It's just another kind of vector. And we all know about vectors and the kind we talk about most often represent like the meaning of a wor word in some context and it's you know effectively a, bu a bunch of numbers you know oftentimes uh, you know a thousand or so um 1024 etc um and the um th the difference with a graph neural network is it's a vector that represents everything around a particular node in the graph topologically. So it's like a topological representation of maybe not the entire graph, but like several levels out from the perspective of a particular node. Um, and what you could then do, and here's where I imagine them being used with LLMs is with, with, um, the, the, with let's say traditional vector-based rag with word embeddings, you're doing similarity calculations and saying how similar are these these two chunks by way of meaning. Um, what you you could do with graph similarity, which is you know I'll use that term to to essentially mean the same thing as G GNNs or similarity among GNNs, is to find other nodes or other things that are um, have similar topologies. So how that might that matter? It's like, all right, this person, um, this account is a fraudster. Um, and I know that because of the topology. Like quite often you can look at the shape of the visualization of a graph uh, of say like a payment network or promotions. So let, let me use a simple example. Um, a kind of fraud that companies often have when they're saying like, uh, here, I'll give you like a $20 promotion for referring someone um well sometimes you have people go out who will just automatically create a hundred different fake accounts and they'll refer them all and they'll just like you know come away with all the all the referral bonuses well if you look at the behavior of those fake accounts um either from a purchasing perspective or looking at their referral patterns usually they're not referring anyone because they're fake accounts um then just the, you can visualize, they kind of look like a star, right? It's like one mm. node with all these other things. And that looks topologically very different from other things in the graph, which are kind of more naturally connected. Now, you know, no one's going to sit around and visually try to go through these all day. So we need some computational approach to do it if we want to automate it. And graph neural networks are one way to do that. Like you could also describe patterns and run it as a uh, pattern match. But um, GNNs can also pick up on, you know, more complex patterns uh, than that one. Um, so it's a, I won't say it's a new technique, but it's a technique that hasn't been applied all that much um, in the general, let's say, IT space. And I think it's promising. This, this is another graph rag pattern that's the, the least popular so far but hey you know fast forward two years next you know we might talk again and say everybody's doing this this is this is the next top technique yeah I, i've found that not many folks do graph neural networks yeah just because i i think it is a a, a typically nuanced sort of approach or you need to have you know re probably very good graph foundations in place in order for you to actually get pretty good vector-based representations um, and, and something that you said earlier, when I asked you about use cases, 
it's interesting to probably see across your customer base, you know, how they are, how they, what you call it, looking at it from a competitive perspective. So I, I already have a graph. Graph rag is the thing. I'm going to go to market, you know, probably a lot sooner than someone else who doesn't have a very good mm-hmm. graph presence. Are you seeing some of that with your customers? Yeah, uh, I definitely am. So there's uh, more broadly, I've seen this pattern where over time, it, you know how uh, Mark Andreessen had has had this thing a long time ago of software is eating the world, which is mm-hmm. proven very true. Um, but we've sort of had our own version of that, which is graphs are eating the world. Mm-hmm. And the, the way that goes is in, you know, I'm convinced this that in every data-driven ha- human activity, every use case, uh, however, how good you can get, how competent you can get at doing a particular thing is limited by how, you know, the degree to which you're, you take the blinders off and start to understand causes and effects more than at distance one or two, but kind of like at a deeper level. Um, and so our, you know, kind, kind of the slow but sure story of graph adoption that's that's occurred you know prior to the current like graph rag uh kind of boost or explosion you've had has been just people across different domains different industries different kinds of problems realizing oh hey you know i've already got this data it's actually connected um if i put it into a graph database then i can suddenly use it in all kinds of ways that previously weren't possible and i can start to see these causes and effects and, you know, predictive patterns. Um, we had an event in San Francisco yesterday and our chief scientist spoke and referred back to um, the keynote speaker for the first conference, like large conference, user conference we had in 2012. Um, a guy named James Fowler, who wrote a book called Connected, and he's a sociologist at UC Irvine. And he made the point that if I'm trying to predict someone's behavior, um, I can actually better predict behavior by understanding who, not just your friends, but your friends of friends and how they behave. Then I can by learning all the things I can in the world about you. So he basically said, if you give me the choice between giving me all the data in the world about you Mm -hmm. uh, and giving me uh, data about your friends of friends of friends, people you never, by definition, you don't know. Um, and in order for me to make a prediction, I will always choose the latter, which is pretty mind blowing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that phenomenon is, you know, it's not surprising, you know, when you think about, we just talked about supply chain, like that's kind of an unsurprising conclusion with supply chain, maybe a little more surprising with uh, kind of social behavior, but there, you know, certainly from a, um, there are lots of use cases where you know fraud detection, money anti money laundering, money laundering by definition is someone creating a lot of intermediaries in order to elude detection. But if you have a technology that's all about connecting the dots, then you know there's no place to hide, as it were. Um, so that's really been the, I think, the journey generally. So. If someone already happened to have a graph data, and I realize like a lot of th- the vast minority of people have already have the data th- that they need for Gen AI in a graph, um, mm-hmm. a-, a larger minority have the skills and maybe access to the technology. Though you know we're huge on open source, we have a free cloud tier. You know we try to democratize it as, as best we can, um, and uh, you know lots of learning and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then, uh, it, yeah, that that puts people ahead. But it's also gotten easier and to get started and to move faster. So it's not like you know it takes years and years to get things bootstrapped and up and running. You can get things up and running in you know days, weeks, months. So okay. um, so it's not like there's that huge a gap. But for for sure, the more graph aware someone already is, that tends you know, probably in every domain, there's at least one company that's approaching things from a graph perspective, which over time puts competitive pressure out there for others to 
do the same in order to get better results. Yep. And and I guess one of the probably most popular applications of that is is knowledge graph. So I, I used to work in search and I used to work in search across many different domains. Yeah. And this thing called knowledge graph was that came up at, at least within the small circles that I um, participated in. So what is a what is a knowledge graph and how do you think it, it helps? How does that fit into the whole graph rag thing? It's just another type of graph system we can query, I guess. A knowledge graph is a graph that you store somewhere. Like best place to store a knowledge graph is obviously a graph database. Mm -hmm. um, and it represents whatever part of the world matters to you for your particular problem. And then in the context of graph rag, you would pull back from it the maybe like a subgraph of the things surrounding the subject and the object. So like the person that asked the question maybe, and the thing, things that they're asking about and the things surrounding those things. That makes sense. All of this is around RAG system. So retrieving sort of the best information possible to give it an LLM to interpret and give us back the answer that we're, we're sort of lazy to interpret ourselves. Uh, what, would you, what would you say are the drawbacks of the current vector-based way of doing RAG? I think vectors are, in any case, pretty broadly useful. So even when you're doing graph rag, oftentimes you can still benefit from also doing vectors. So they're not; it's not a, it's not either or. In other words, okay. The but the downsides are that much in the same way that LLMs don't provide any transparency with regard to you know what what's going on inside the neural network, um, you can't look at a vector. Or a vector similarity calculation and really understand what's going on, right? Like at least logically or connect it to our concepts. Um, so lack of transparency. Also, I'll say it's effectively like one kind of algorithm against one kind of data set and one kind of index. And as one, it's, it's kind of natural that regardless of what that algorithm is, that as time progresses and you want to get better, you tend to want to apply more techniques. So in, in the broadest way, it's just one approach. Um, and, uh, and so it's only natural that you'd have other approaches um, show up as, as being useful. Makes sense. And so inside of uh, any RAG system, there's a vector database. I, I just learned that Neo4j has a vector database. Tell us, tell us more about that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, we. Uh, it turns out that if you already have a database management system and you know, kind of all the infrastructure and hooks internally to um, you know th that is required of a database, you um, including whatever ability to store different data types and way of handling different indexes and querying and transactions and APIs and so on. That uh, adding one more data type and one more kind of index um, isn't really that hard. Uh, so we added a vector data type and then um, a vector index on top of that so you can do a sim mm. similarity search. And we did that because um, you know, we're uh, perfectly fine with architectures where you know, someone's already got an existing vector database or for some reason wants the vectors to be there, but we foresaw that you know for uh, it'd be a con it'd be a pretty big convenience to not have to use a, a separate technology. Um, you know, if your problem can be solved by just having the vectors alongside the graph, um, mm -hmm. that was one reason. Another uh, reason that showed up is uh, that. Non intuitively to me, in addition to the graph we've talked about, which is like the graph of your world model in your uh, domain. So let's call that the domain graph. It's, it's also, um, it can be helpful in uh, using your vectors more effectively to be able to actually structure the chunks and the relationship between chunks. So, like next chunk, next chunk, next chunk. And then the relationship between a chunk and where it sits on a page, like if it's in a table, probably trust it more 
than if it's in body text and if it's in a title, maybe it's somewhere in between. And if it's part of a, you know, FCC or FDA or SEC filing, I'll trust it more than if it's, you know, um, something in a user forum or written by, you know, likewise, who's the actual author? Is it an intern or is it a Nobel laureate? Like you might want to weigh those a little bit differently. So, um, it turns out that you actually have a graph of the structure of the vectors that can be useful independent of the uh, domain graph. Um, and the term for this is lexical graph. Um, that's also a very easy graph to build. Um, the domain graph, depending on whether you know your data is structured or unstructured, can be you know ra range anywhere from relatively easy to you know kind of tricky to get your data into a graph, but the lexical graph is pretty easy. And then linking it to the domain is often not that hard, like, you know, to do entity extraction or, you know, with LLMs or with more classic NLP techniques. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I was reading a paper yesterday on so this notion of chunk continuity or the context from which this chunk came in. And I saw hmm. some folks maybe doing like a document level chunk in addition saying okay um so you're almost kind of summarizing both vectors so that's a very sing very interesting approach just building a graph on your vector chunks like i kind of like that um so within sort of the retrieval pipeline right how are you when a prompt comes in right uh, i think it's going to a vector database right now it, it gets embedded it gets into a vector i pull quote unquote relevant chunks and then i think it gets sent to the graph database is that sort of the flow or one one particular flow? yeah that's one flow so that would be the flow where you're maybe doing filtering with the knowledge graph or ranking with the knowledge graph as you grab the okay. vectors and then along the way you um you, you then you might call back to the graph, either in the same call or in a separate call, depending on where they respectively are. And, um, and then the way you might filter rank with the, with the graph is to say, if this vector has this particular term or concept in it, or if it's part of this particular, say like support case, and I want, I want to filter out support cases that are related to older, um, you know, uh, older products or newer products than the one that the question is being asked about. So kind of like filter according to data you already have about like how that question, you know, what product the person called about when filing their case, so, because the most frequent answer may not be the one that's relevant to them based on the product they own um, and or the version of software, et cetera. You might also rank the results then based on some kind of like graph-based ranking, like page rank hmm. of uh, if it's got the most inbound uh, links from cases with a disposition of closed success, like basically count those up as uh, using the page rank algorithm. And then that just gets, shows up in the node as a weight. And then you can um, rank your vectors according to those weights. So that's one pattern. Another pattern is, hey, I want to take the question or some part of the question and answer, get an answer from the graph directly. And there you, you have two choices or two patterns. Um, and it depends on how uh, narrow the universe of questions is that's allowable through that app. If it's a very broad universe of questions and it's kind of more ad hoc, you know, anyone can ask anything then you would actually do something called text decipher of using an LLM and other techniques. And we, we've been building open source stuff to make this easier um, and, and higher quality, but you know, much like text to SQL, right? Is I'm, uh, I'm going to take the question and then I'm going to, and this might turn into a couple of calls of like, okay, what, uh, how does that map to the graph? based on some information about the schema and then shoot that to an LLM uh, alongside with information about the schema to generate a query and then run the query. And then maybe that's a, a multi-shot as well, where if the query fails, you give it another, another try. Um, so that's 
an evolving space. Uh, and, but I've, I've talked to a number of customers building their own and we, we've been doing lots of experiments and putting stuff out there and, uh, you know, for, for the right kinds of domains and questions, you can actually get pretty good with this already. Um, and it'll hmm. only get better. And then there's, there's another sub pattern there of if it's a narrow universe of questions, you might just map to multiple canned queries that are hard coded and just pass in variables to those queries. Now, how do you map text to query? You, you can actually just create a vector and do a vector similarity match of the question text uh, that's being passed in and the question text that corresponds to the various queries. So that's kind of like a fun trick of mm -hmm. using vectors as part of your pipeline to actually match to the nearest query. So it's like a FAQ, almost like a you know, I pull up the closest question to what I have in the FAQ and I use that as new input data to do subsequent queries, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so I think one, people are discussing it, but right now a lot of Gen AI applications are, you know, they're multi tuned so in our conversation, but they're, they're very time bound. I, I have to produce this result quite fast. So what's your your gut sense on I can achieve better accuracy in a you know in a single LLM call by reaching out to a graph and sort of verifying the information that's coming into the LLM. What if I had more time? Right. What, and, and what does that pattern look like? Yeah. And you mean like time for the execution to happen? So like end to end latency for that particular set of calls? Correct. Yeah, I could answer the question tomorrow. I don't have to answer the question in the next one second, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd say there, I mean, obviously the more calls to LLMs and the more agents and the, you know, the, the, the more latency that tends to introduce, um, there tends to be a trade-off between, uh, you know, what model you use, how large it is, where it's running, um, how much you care about accuracy. So there's, there's sort of like a, um, three-way trade-off between, you could say, accuracy for that particular question, latency, and cost. Um, and you, you've got companies like Unify.ai. I, th I think um, uh, another one was uh, um, Neptune.ai, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. My, uh, th they were doing this. I, th I think they might have pivoted a little bit, but might still do this. Of like. LLM router, like for each particular question based on the current state of the art LLMs route to that. So that's definitely a part of it. And I'd say for uh, translating text to Cypher, which, you know, does, does involve one or more model calls, like we're saying, um, we're looking at just training a small model for that. You don't need mm -hmm. everything authored by humanity, like for all, <laughs> uh, in, in order to, um, in your model in order to be able to do that effectively. Um, I'd also say that the a call to a database, like just doing a transactional query, is super, super fast, like way faster than a call to an LLM. So mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is again a trick that you can use if there's an exact answer in the data in the database, then it's just simply remembering, hey, let's remember to use that and not ask the LLM because it's going to add slowness. Uh, it's also a lot more expensive, right, to, to, to run things through an LLM than just through a, a database query. Um, so mm. those, were, those would probably be my top pieces of advice. Yeah. On the, the latency side of a graph query, so can you share how that latency, what that profile looks like? So when that, for instance, let's say, when you're doing a lot of inference, a prompt is short. It'll inference will typically happen much faster because your attention over that short sequence is fast. As the sequence grows, that corresponding attention uh, grows. Uh, most we could get a almost linear, almost linear, depending on the technique that's being used. What does that look like for graphs? So a longer prompt does that mean I'll have a bigger graph query? Not necessarily. The the um. The latency of a graph query is dependent on the uh, local 
network around the graph and ultimately like how many hops you have to make. I, in, this is interesting because it's actually different than the physics of a relational database. In a relational mm -hmm. database, a query will get slower if the tables, you know, as the amount of data grows in the tables, that slows individual queries down because you have to index everything in the table. And the more you index it, the more deeper your index gets, and that's actually more hits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it gets uh, much worse as you add joins. Um, with uh, at least what's called a native graph database, where you have this quality called index-free adjacency, where essentially every node uh, has a pointer to the relationships around it, and, and which have a pointer to the node on the other end. So you're not having to go through indexes that get bigger and slower as your total data set grows. Mm -hmm. the, the amount of time it gets to get from node A to B, C, D, E, F, G is dictated only by the number of relationships I need to traverse through. So it's very local to your question and local to your data. Mm -hmm. um, so the um, so for a transactional graph query, it's it's purely that it's you know if you have an anchor point, you're just then spidering out from the anchor point. And with Neo4j, you can get somewhere around like two million pointer chasing operations per second. So let's say two million hops per second, um, wow. which is pretty darn fast and, and also very compute efficient. So you usually don't need tons and tons of hardware to to get this stuff done. Okay, that's super interesting. So therefore, as as you folks think about GraphRag applications, when a query comes in, first identifying probably how many nodes in the graph I may actually query, and then what is the corresponding number of relationships around those nodes. That's a good maybe scaling proxy for how long a graph query might take. I would say yes, but you usually don't know that answer ahead of time. Ahead of time. But, but I'd say if it's a transactional pattern match, then usually, you know, most kinds of questions that you would ask would would return in, you know, milliseconds, sub millisecond, you know, certainly sub tens of milliseconds. Um, the kinds of operations that take longer is if I want to run page rank or, you know, you, th across my graph, then you're taking your entire graph, ripping it into at least the way Neo4j does it, into a you know, 10x compressed memory structure, doing all your matrix computation, calculating weights for every single node, and then iterating. And you oftentimes do that like five times. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, you can do that these days with, um, you know, let's say, a billion nodes and relationships, which I'll call maybe like a large, but you know, not, you know, there, there are certainly much bigger ones. Let's say that's a respectable size graph. You can, I think, page rank runs ten seconds, twenty seconds on hmm. on that size graph. So those are longer, but then that's not something you do with every transaction. That's something you might do once a day um, or once a week. Um, uh, computing GNN, likewise, like that's something you probably do more in bulk. Though you could do it as part of your pipeline. And again, there there are d different algorithms are more or less computationally efficient. Um, when we first started with GNNs, the, the most popular algorithm was um, GraphSage, which mm -hmm. uh, you know everyone tends to know about. Um, turns out that we we found a paper on a um, an algorithm called FastRP, which is like almost as good as GraphSage. It's like a little bit fuzzier or you know lossier, um, but it's ten thousand times faster. So. You know, usually I say, don't forget about graph sage, go straight to fast RP. It's much more pragmatic back to the, you know, kind of pragmatic angle that we all want to be taking on this. That's very exciting. Oh, I didn't know. I learned, learned something new. Um, how would you say, let's talk about the scale of mm -hmm. sort of a graph. Um, excuse me. At which scale do you end up seeing graph rag perform better? than just a pure vector-based approach. So is it, you know, I'm doing a couple of queries, I, I can get, what does that sort of look like? Meaning scale of graph, probably. I would say, I haven't seen that it's related to scale of 
graph or scale of data. Yeah. It's more the kind of question that you're asking. So it's more of, let's say, like a logical consideration. And there it's cases where um, maybe maybe amount of data does play into it, but like it, it shows up starting at a pretty low scale. So and anyone with like enough data that you're doing graph rag, uh, that you're doing rag, um, probably, you know, will benefit from graph rag. And then as to whether it's, it's worth doing the work of graph rag in addition to vectors, because you don't need it. Vectors are a bit, what's nice is they're kind of brainless, right? You just put them out there and, and not entirely, right? You need to figure out your chunk size and uh, there, there, there can be some trickiness to it and doing anything at high levels of scale requires extra engineering, but they're relatively straightforward. Um, and, uh, and so that, you know, that comes back to stakes. So I'd say the determining factor is not so much scale, whether you want to use graph rag and graph rag adds value. It's more this question of high dollar value, brand and reputational impact, health and human safety bias, uh, regulatory. And, and these all then tie back to, um, being able to gain from the three main benefits of graph rag. I think earlier I talked about the main two, which is like be better results and more Fancy. explainable results. Mm -hmm. Another one that you get is once you've invested in building the graph, just being able to visualize the graph while you're writing your application can actually be very clarifying. Um, and so we've seen customers just fix bugs, even with just being able to visualize the relationship between their vectors and their documents. And so like the lexical side of the house. Mm. That's awesome. Cause you have tags of department and where documents are coming from topics. So you could see it from many different angles, I imagine, right? Yeah. You could also see how like the, you know, your vector, uh, might misclassify something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll use an example and I don't know if this one's true is not so, uh, true or not. So take it more in the, in, in the broader sense that if you have a vector for a fruit apple and a vector for the company apple, they're, they're, they're probably more similar. They're probably a lot more similar than the company apple and a pear. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I mean, should they be like, probably, like, probably not. So like uh, there's, you know, th th this is because you're dealing with linguistics and statistics around words and not explicit defined meaning. And so when dealing with one's domain, you'll sometimes have these things pop up and you can tend to catch those when you're visualizing things and like linking the vector chunks, uh, back to the graph of meaning. Huh. So I've been wondering this for a while, actually. So when you create some embedding model, essentially you're arranging some higher dimensional space. Let's say in this case, text embedding model, a piece of text comes through, gets to in, into a vector. A vector is just a set of coordinates. So there's some arrangement of all these objects or vectors in that space. So it sounds like if I come into a graph domain, I could actually say, okay, this vector should not be in this part of the space. It should be probably closer somewhere else. Um, so you have, it, it sounds like you have an ability to do that. Well, I, graphs? I, I guess you would notice it. And then can you coerce your vector generation algorithm to put it in a different space? No, not really. But then, okay. but, but then you could, th that could change how you use the, the vectors uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, how you use the graph. It's another way to look at this is, Vectors are kind of in the sub symbolic numerical realm, and then graphs are uh, more in the symbolic space of here, here are my defined concepts. And, you know, there's kind of been long been this idea of no symbolic or, you know, combining those two things. Um, I also see that as a little bit of like left brain, right brain in terms yeah. of the human. You, you want both hemispheres to solve many kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and this is the kind of thing you get with with this marriage of graphs on one hand, like primarily symbolic. There's you, you could argue you, you th there's certainly sub symbolic stuff in there, like GNNs is a prime example. But this highly symbolic world with the highly sub symbolic world. Hmm. 
It does seem like a really interesting, I'm just imagining a workflow where I could visually move my vectors around where they want to be. And, and that's now my new training data set. And I retrain this encoder to say, okay, the next time you push in the same data, I want it to land sort of in this arrangement. So that's, um, okay. I, so that, so that's actually a super interesting topic you're treading into, which is separate from graph rag and is another way graphs can potentially be used is to train models uh, okay. or to fine tune models. Um, mm. And I've, uh, I've, I've actually talked to some companies that are doing this and like creating synthetic data off of a graph, which is, and then training off of that. Oh, that's okay. I you know, really big my interest. I, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta dig into that. Uh, some more. Um, see, oh, here's, here's a really interesting one. So I read that you were saying graphs end up using fewer tokens and we're all trying to be uh, stingy on, on the number of tokens that we use both in and probably out. Can you explain how that works? I'd say that one is case sensitive okay. and, you know, might be offset by like tokens that you use to generate your graph query. Um, mm. So I, I think TBD, I'm, I'm, that, that's one of the observations that I think needs to be proven out okay. a little bit more. But um, I have seen some papers coming out suggesting that as a whole, uh, you probably do end up needing fewer tokens with a graph um, because you can be more precise and concise about the data that you're feeding in as context. Um, hmm. So you, you can pull from the graph just the things that you need formulated into sentences. We've actually been looking at different ways to condense that even further. So it's not in human language. You can put it into some kind of condensed graph representation. I mean, because after all, it seems kind of silly for machines talking to machines to use human language as, <laughs> as, as an right. API, but that's that's kind of where we are now, right? So it's a, a point in time. Um, so it does seem like it's probably true because you can um, pull just very condensed stuff out of your graph and use that as context. And then also because your results will then oftentimes be better because you put in this much higher quality data um, mm -hmm. that might require fewer calls to an LLM um, in order to refine if, if you're doing a multi-shot type thing. But if, if, if anyone's trying this out and has an opinion or observations one way or the other, um, I think Mark and I would both be interested in hearing from you. Yeah, definitely. So should people build a RAG, or in this case, a graph RAG, Full use case or one sort of graph rag system that just indexes a lot of, you know, it'll serve a ton of different use cases. How, how are you seeing folks reason through that? I, so usually I see people starting with doing rag, you know, graph rag or rag on, you'll start with one system or one application. Um, on the other hand, if I look at how people are looking at graphs and graph databases as an enterprise capability. I'm increasingly seeing, uh, you know, like IT recognize that this is a capability and a kind of technology that you want across multiple departments and want people to be able to pick up. Um, then you get the question of, is it all one system? Is it centralized? Is it multiple systems? And I think the answer there is probably similar to with other technologies, it's it's kind of a mixture of both. One thing Neo4j lets you do, which is pretty pretty cool, is subject to the right permissions, you can run federated queries across graphs. Mm. Um, and then another one is you get these really uh, unexpected data network effects and use case network effects. Turns out, if you bring in all the data that you want to solve, um, I don't know fraud across a payment network or, you know, yesterday we just had a talk from a pharma company with uh, fraud around, um, you know, selling fake, uh, you know, fake versions of their pharma, of, of their uh, prescription drugs mm -hmm. that um, once you have the data to solve that particular problem, that might be all or most of the data that you already need, that you need in order to solve a recommendation. Right. If if I already have 
information about how people are buying so that I can find patterns that look like they're fraudulent, then I can I probably have all the same data I need in order to make a high quality recommendation. Um, and you have these cascading effects. And you know, then if I want to do a product promotion, all right, then I bring in the promotions hierarchy, but I already have the product hierarchy and the customers mm-hmm. and now I add the shopping cart. So the um so graphs have this natural quality and ability uh, to be additive in terms of the data and then multiplicative in terms of the value. The, um, yeah, so I, I, th- I think that will start to show up as these Gen AI and GraphRag applications get more mature. Technically, it's a challenge, but updating information or updating a graph, updating a vector database. So in the case of updating a vector database, let's say my new sphere of knowledge is, is something bigger, I'll probably retrain this encoder and unless I trust that the new data coming in fits within the sort of total space of knowledge of that model. Um, what does updating knowledge in a graph look like? Let me talk about constructing the graph first. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm going to construct the graph, I usually have one of three scenarios. So one is um, I have unstructured data. So that's, that's where our minds go to first, right? When we're mm-hmm. talking Gen AI. So it uh, comes from whatever transcripts or PDFs or web pages or what have you. Um, the uh, other is I have structured data. So my data is like in a SQL database or in files or, you know, uh, but in, in some kind of structured format in spreadsheets. And then you have the, you know, kind of in between one, which I have data in both. And an example of both is, let's say I'm, um, let's say I'm doing equipment maintenance and I have all these maintenance records and then I want to bring that in. Well, maintenance records for what? Um, because you want to be able to actually relate the maintenance net, net records and tie them into like, what are the individual, let's say it's cars or tractors. Mm-hmm. What are the individual cars? Or, so Caterpillar actually did a, uses Neo4j for this. And there's a talk out there on YouTube from a few years ago, pre LLM, but they used NLP pretty heavily, um, to, I need to know like what the individual tractors are and what the model is and who owns them and so on and so forth. That's probably in a relational database somewhere. Mm-hmm. And now if I actually start with that, because bringing your structured data in is really easy. Um, there's a you know a bunch of tools for it. There's a pattern you can use, which is basically tables to labels. Each row in a table gets brought in as a node and then labeled with a you know label, same label as the table name effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, and then your primary key becomes a node key. So that's a pretty straight translation. Um, join tables, each row becomes a relationship in a particular direction. And if it's attributed, that you know shows up as relationship properties. So uh, in that example, which is probably the more common one that I see, I've I've got something that I then want to hook, like the, this master data, if you want to call it that of what what my products are, what my customers are, what the company names are that I'm looking for, then, uh, or even like customer ID, that sort of thing, then as part of your pipeline for ingesting from the unstructured data, you can then refer back to that graph, do lookups, um, you know, inject contacts, say, look for these particular things, and then not only tie the two together, but use that to inform how you create the graph and, you know, Hey, if I've got this particular kind of, you know, pr- product name or product category name that, uh, that gets recognized and dropped in as a node, uh, with, with that particular label. Um, this is a brand new area and I'd say LLMs are pretty good at getting like, you know, getting over the bootstrapping problem, but then, you know, they're, you need to do a bit of extra work to do like entity reconciliation and, you know, not have, not have duplicate entities. And some of the frameworks like uh, Langchain, Llama Index, Haystack are starting to do some of that. Um, Neo4j has got 
some some tech to do that. There's something we call the LLM graph builder, which is mm-hmm. very visual and a little bit more meant as a demo, but it's it's a great tool where in a couple of minutes you can just point to, you know, s- scrape any web page or PDF or you know create a knowledge graph from it, and it'll do your lexical graph in addition to your domain graph. Um, and it's you know th- the domain side of it might be not entirely perfect, but it's pretty good. And then from there, you either leave it as is, depending on how much accuracy you want, or, you know, oftentimes you want more accuracy and you can, um, uh, you know, then find different ways to curate it either through rules or, you know, ultimately through human curation, if it's very, uh, very high stakes. That sounds like if, if graph rag holds a lot more people will be, um, maybe working with graphs and, and making sure that those systems are pruned and cleaned and uh, serving the enterprise. That's right. How, yeah. How are you and the team thinking about large models versus small models? You know, that's always the big, the big debate. Yeah. So I mentioned we're looking at small models as a way to, you know, do text to cipher. Mm-hmm. And that's mainly for cost reasons, I guess, but, you of know, and, and we can train a small model to be, extra good at it. Um, so, you know, might get better than a large model. At mm-hmm. least that's the, that's the idea. Um, but we're, I'd say graph rag as a principle or as a pattern is kind of neutral or, you know, with respect to, are you using a large or a small model? Mm-hmm. The reason I see people using small models tends to be either, you know, cost or security. Um, mm-hmm. you know, if, uh, Companies oftentimes want to run things in house whenever they can, and so having uh, using their own their own small models gives them that. But then also, if you're trying to carry out a very specific task inside of an agentic architecture, then you don't need a large model that's been trained on the entire world, um, which is going to be ten times more expensive because it's so much bigger. Mm-hmm. So you just mentioned agentic. What's your what's your take on on graphs, graph rag, and agents. Certainly, there's a case for agents uh, using graph rag in, mm-hmm. inside of certain agents, and you know maybe some are just using vectors, and maybe some are just using graphs, and maybe some are using both. And then the agent, um, then you have a graph of agents in more complex agentic architectures, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this isn't something I've seen with, but a lot of the agent folks that I talk to at companies building agentic systems and infrastructures are seeing that and saying, hey, maybe a graph database is a good way to store the graph of agents in inside of infrastructures where you have a lot of agents and it's a large, let's say, um, mission critical system. And I need to be able to replicate that rule set across a large, um, you know, across a global infrastructure. So certainly not the world's biggest graphs, like objectively speaking, these are tiny in terms of total amount of data, but that's, uh, that's another place where graph shows up. They show up in a lot of places also show up in data lineage, like how data moves across the company. And Hmm. given that the quality of an AI result depends very much on the uh, data that's being used, then um, actually there's a whole traceability, uh, you know, kind of use of graphs that you see as part of preparing for uh, preparing your data or you know auditing your data with respect to timeliness and quality and different definitions and and storing your entity resolved uh, your resolved entities and so on. Wow. Okay. This this topic is getting now we. <laughs> I'm more excited to go read more about graphs and, and get prepared for that because it. I think as we come into the multimodal representation, I was having a chat with someone yesterday and actually it was earlier today. So inside of an LLM, I have a bunch of chunks of text that quote unquote try to re-represent the world. Um, we embed those chunks of text, we represent them as vectors. But now when multimodal really starts to come into play, there's a new sort of representation of, a, of an object, both visually and probably auditorially yeah. uh, as well. How are you seeing graphs being integrated into multimodal 
graph rag. <laughs> so far, primarily, yeah. it's been in you know th- by way of text, meaning okay. you transcribe your audio or your video, and then you use that as text, and then you relate that to concepts that are stored as text. Mm-hmm. Um, so the you know, but so, yeah, so far it's been purely that. I don't know what other multimodal use cases look like, but audience, if you if you have any other ideas, um, feel free to send them my way. Yeah, and the Gen AI revolution, or quote unquote, or era, I think is probably made the robotics era a lot more possible than we thought it was previously. Yeah. How do you think, not necessarily graph rag, but how do you think graphs will play into sort of robotics and that level of reasoning? That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't seen many robotics use cases. So, you know, there's, there's the, you know, all the manufacturing of robotic, the robots where you have supply chain and the repair of robots and, you know, m- maybe the left brain, right brain thing around graph rag, you know, that, that if you want them to do more complex reasoning, um, for things that don't actually involve motion, um, Mm -hmm. maybe, I mean, graphs are kind of the origin story for graph theory was a geospatial problem that got solved, you know, like uh, the seven bridges of Conisberg, which actually was solved non-geospatially by Leonard Euler is like, actually the ge- geographic coordinates don't matter. This is all about paths, but then you can overlay, um, uh, uh, you can overlay geographic coordinates with graphs and when, when visualizing or just when doing compute. Um, and that combination can be pretty powerful. So I could see that come, coming up in robotics as well and maybe it's happening i just haven't seen it great well hopefully for those that are listening you got your fill of of graph rag we just had a solid hour and 15 minutes of of graph rag discussion uh, so philip i wanted to to get more lessons from your journey in tech you know you've been at neo 4 j for for 12 years and, and you said at the beginning that's not necessarily the norm what what's kept you there for so long it's really uh, the the vision of what's what we're doing in the mission, and the mission is looking beyond the headlines or like the surface of what we're presented. I, I, I believe we fundamentally need this in a day of age of day and age of everything is moving so fast. It's it's really hard to take the time to look at what's happening underneath the surface, and then we're also like gamified uh, by uh you know by, by a lot of external actors and companies who are exploiting like our you know our lizard brains and our attention system to uh to become more reactive so i feel like it's a a counter pressure to that but also a way of us you know more deeply understanding the world around us um and this comes back to a way of working with data but it's actually a way of thinking um so that that's that's something I'm really passionate about. Also, the team I've loved the team here, you know. Uh, so that's that's a big part of it too. And then uh, a third thing is just the ambition of um, what really started before I joined with the founders of saying, "Hey, you know, if you were to design a database from scratch today to solve, you know, the kind of data problems that show up and." you know, le- leverage all the latest advancements in compute, probably look more like this. And then, you know, kind of building a whole technology ground up around it. Um, and so the the kind of like the fun and ambition of creating a category and uh, having a pioneering product in that category. And I personally, like, you know, I have a lot of respect for all kinds of business models, uh, but I particularly like um, working in a field where we're customer obsessed and not really looking behind at what competitors are doing or or not having to look ahead and, you know, Mm -hmm. copy other people, but really just thinking um, more creatively about how to solve problems. So you're almost expanding your own universe by just being customer obsessed and applying this new way of thinking 
to, to different domains. Totally. Yeah, and I do like the fact that that, that should be on a t-shirt. Uh, graphs are, are a mindset or something like that. I, I hadn't really thought yeah. about it yeah. that way, you know? Um, so I, I really like that you said that. You had posted on LinkedIn recently where... Oh, oh my words oh, yeah, are going to yeah. come back to haunt me. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's actually good. It's okay. more philosophical, right? So what does one do when the thing you've been working on for a decade hmm. suddenly proves valuable in ways that are different from what, you, from what anyone imagined? Why did you write this? I, I, I guess in many ways, this comes back to the idea that success can come from you know, chance as much as hard work and preparation and anticipation. Mm. And the, kind of the graph rag moment was you know, what, one of the times that graphs just got this extra boost of awareness. But you, know, you can do... The Microsoft paper didn't actually use a database. It used libraries. But it turns out if you have a graph database and all the tooling around it to visualize and write code and have a query language and persist your knowledge graph, um, you can do far more at far greater scale, at far greater impact, and far greater depth. And um, you know, no, we certainly didn't anticipate what Gen AI would look like, and uh, and so it's like, all right, we've just you know fallen into the right place through uh, you know it's definitely through deliberate effort, but not anticipating the application. Uh, so that's mm. been really fun. You've seen probably the internet when it to some degree started off or was mm-hmm. you were probably in the, in the dot com boom to a degree and you've seen all the major waves right the, the e-commerce wave mm-hmm. cloud all of that mobile yeah mobile so you you've seen quote unquote generational or tectonic shifts in technology um what's your suspicion on what's different this time I, I guess the consensus on the street is, you know, everybody's saying that this is probably bigger. You know, it feels like it's bigger than the dot com boom. Um, oh, it is. What, I mean, what, what's what's interesting is it's also happening at a time where economically, um, you've got you know the, the effect of higher interest rates, which has kind of made most of tech actually. Um, you know, except for the largest companies, which have you know continued to turn huge profits and grow at incredible rates at, at massive scale, um, where you know you've you've kind of got a much more muted startup IPO scene, um, et cetera, hmm. than uh, than in in decades. But at the same time, you've got this massive boost and promise and. And so on. Um, I think it's incumbent on us as a tech community to just keep pushing the limits, which everybody is like every day there's something new coming out to make sure that this doesn't just languish into, hey, we've got a lot of really cool prototypes, but it's not getting anywhere beyond that because that's just like burning money. Um, but I, I feel confident that we'll get there and we're slowly getting there. And it's it's nice to know that you know, with, with our small contribution, right, to graph rag, that that can play a role in helping to break past that. Mm-hmm. And so going along with that trend, so you've, you've seen all the waves come through and you, you've seen folks who, uh, who built good enough boats to, to you know, surf mm-hmm. and then float on top of the water, and then folks who just got essentially washed away. Um, there are lots of startups coming out now. What's your advice to folks building startups, Gen AI startups? I'd say it's, uh, you know, try, you need to find product market fit, but then you also need to very quickly figure out how you're going to get not just adoption, but make money. And a common mistake I've seen startups make, you know, for including in previous waves is it's, it's easy for founders and I mean, everyone at the company um, and investors to get really excited about how many users you have. But mm. then, you know, at some point, your company is going to need to make money and turn a profit. And at some level, there's a tension between, uh, uh, you know, adoption fuels monetization. You can't have monetization without adoption. But um, at some point, and that, that point in that line is different for each startup and each stage. 
But at some point, those two things become at odds. In other words, if I'm making cars and I'm giving away all my cars, then I'm going to be the market leader because you know I've just given away all my cars. But it's probably not a very profitable business. I'm not going to be in business for very long. That's an absurd mm-hmm. example, but that's actually out of a lot of um, you know Silicon Valley startups run uh, uh, for a little bit too long. So in, even if you haven't turned on the monetization dials, having some hypotheses that you are continually revisiting and tweaking of how you're going to monetize, I'd say that's a pretty important thing. And I'll throw it out because we, we are in an age where investors are much, much more, you know, you've got uh, no risk gains of 5%. You need to compete against that. And mm. while uh, Gen AI is in its own sort of bubble, um, the rest of tech and SaaS is not. So like, I, I'm very mindful of, um, of that, of, you know, that, that, that could change it any day. And that's the nature of these cycles. Hmm. That's a good point. So you're a, you're a CTO. What advice uh, do you have for becoming a CTO? Cause many folks want to, to take that career path. And I, I noticed that you went the product route and you had a couple of different journeys. Can you share a bit more about that? I've zigzagged a bit. Like I've been back and forth, you know, between you know, obviously more, a lot more hands-on earlier in my career, but worked a lot with databases and, you know, at, at the junction of database and, uh, at, sorry, of uh, technology and business um, in consulting. And then that got me into product management, which is, at the intersection of business and technology. Uh, the So I'd say most of my career recently has been in product management, which mm-hmm. I love because, you know, you, you do get to look at, you know, always ask the five whys of like, okay, why is this user asking for this particular thing? Um, because the first answer they tell you, I can guarantee, like that's not really going to tell you why they need the thing. Um, mm. It might be some how they imagine you solving their problem, but if you do exactly what they're saying, you might actually not solve their problem in the best way or at all. Um, and I think there it's a lot of critical thinking, getting involved in a lot of you know different areas, and also staying close to tech. I'd say in general, it's more important than ever to stay close to the technology and. Uh, you know, how do you do that? A lot of it is, you know, uh, checking out what's out there. A lot of it is talking to people. So I'd say there's a huge mm-hmm. value in leveraging the community around you, which is easier than ever, um, wherever you live in the world, because there, there are just so many virtual resources and discord chats and YouTube videos and great podcasts like your own and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd say community like you know f- find communities around that are using different stacks that you're using or that are you know maybe more generalized tech and local to where you are um and uh be curious and also you know have a have have a high bar for your own work and a you know expand your interest beyond the immediate thing that you're doing and the problem that you're solving not to say you should go jump into other people's swim lanes all the time but uh, throughout my career, I found uh, it was always interesting to me and useful to whatever I was doing to to understand the bigger context of what I was doing, so that I could see what the cracks were between my defined function and others, so that I could then go and engage with people at the border and figure out how we're going to fill the cracks. And if that means I jump in, I jump in. Um, one of the pieces of advice I often have for uh, aspiring PMs who have this vision of the PM role as like being the CEO of the product. You hear that a lot. Well, you're also the janitor of the product. I mean, your job mm. is to, for that product to be successful uh, and flipping it around, much more importantly, for that product to be successful, users need to be successful with it. And, you know, whatever it takes. That y- you should also put that on a t-shirt, janitor <laughs> of the product. Yeah, I am janitor clean. of the product. Yeah. That's clean. Totally. Um, yeah. I, I do love that, that framing. I did notice that you had a bachelor's in chemical engineering. I also have a bachelor's in chemical engineering. So really? Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. I, 
I, I'm secretly tracking all the folks who come from chemical engineering and no longer do it. And they're in AI and just do other really interesting things. Um, there are quite a few. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty surprising. Can you, can you talk a bit about that? I know we're a little over time, but I, I find that fascinating. Well, I, I went into chemical engineering just because, I mean, partly my personality is I, I like to do things at the intersection of things that I find really interesting and then things that I'm told are hard. <laughs> so okay. this was, and also things that, you know, like pragmatically speaking at the time, um, I saw it as uh, giving me some useful skills. I ended up not using them in the way I thought I would. I got into software right after school. But um, hmm. but but I think a lot of the thinking I learned incidentally ended up applying to software because the flow of chemicals uh, you know, with uh, certain relative uh, quantities and temperature and flow and state of <laughs> state of uh, matter and so on um, from one reactor or one device, you know, crystallizer, reactor, evaporator, um, distillation column to the other, right? I'm bringing you back to your, mm -hmm, <laughs> from your mm -hmm, senior yeah. labs, um, is actually looks exactly like the flow of data between programs. So mm -hmm. like it's, there's just a direct correspondence there. Um, but the, uh, the reason I went into it is it's, I, I loved physics, chemistry, okay. math. So it combined those three things. Everybody told me it was one of the harder majors. So I was like, all right, let's do it. Um, and then supposedly it was one of the higher paying majors coming out of school. Uh, but I, I kind of flunked on the getting a chemical engineering job and ended up in software. But hey, no regrets at all. Yeah, it worked out. That was my number one criteria. I was like, okay. I don't know what I want to do. These people get paid the most because Trinidad has oil. I'm like, okay, I'm doing chemical engineering. Uh, so that was, thanks for sharing that. Um, what's been your career optimization function? Is it, is it wealth? It seems like hard problems to solve. How have you, what's been your, your guiding light in your career? Um, I'd say it's been, it's a, to some level, it's, it's been, a little bit of keeping my eyes open for opportunity. And then when I see something that I like or that, or that needs to be done, you know, so, some of it has been um, trying to understand the bigger task. And is it, is it something that I can relate to that um, I can take pride in doing? And at the end of the day, you can kind of gamify yourself into taking pride into doing absolutely anything. Like when I was in, I worked my way through college working at a, at a chop suey restaurant and Ooh. I would, you know, kind of gamify like packing orders and, you know, and just like doing multitasking and do all, doing all these things and like literally reaching my ungloved hand into the grease trap and clearing it out. It's like, you know, Hey, I'm just going to do it all and not shy away from anything. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, I, th I think actually all forms of work, um, certainly, you know, probably all forms of work, certainly most forms of work have that element in them. Like it's doing some good in some way. And by just diving in wholeheartedly, um, you can have more fun, you can learn more. Uh, but then also going outside of just the prescribed role. Um, mm -hmm. What I like about product management and also the CTO role is there's um, you can make it at least to some degree, there's a lot of flexibility in deciding how you want to apply yourself and how you want to make it. And even in PM, like heading up a PM org, you, you can choose like, am I, you know, is PM going to be uh, the, the kind of product management function that uh, like kind of inspires engineers and helps them understand what to build and then be a little more hands off uh, and make your job like making sure engineering knows enough about the problems being solved to then apply their creative energy in the right direction um, and that the problems keeping you up at night in relation to the product are the same ones that are keeping them up to at night you know or being 
much tighter and, you know, part of the daily scrum and so on. Like those are both cool. And it depends on the team and the geography and, you know, the skills, um, which one you want to do. So, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, no, that's it, it definitely I'm does. Like, yeah. um, what three books you recommend folks read? It could be anything. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, the, um, oh man. So I like Think Again by Adam Grant, which is kind of about, mm. of, about questioning assumptions that I read pretty recently. I love um, Annie Duke uh, Quit. Actually, Thinking in, in Bets is maybe her better known book, book but okay. Quit is about, you know, hey, we're always told just keep trying, keep trying to keep trying. And she, she's like a, you know, master championship poker player turned, uh, you know, um, consultant and, and speaker and author. And, you know, she, she basically looks at that and says, well, it makes sense in certain contexts, but it's, you know, just pretty dumb in other contexts. Like if, if something isn't working at some point, you need to just stop trying that thing and change. Um, so, uh, so I think that one's good, particularly for Americans to read because we're, we're, you know, very, uh, it's imprinted on us, right? Like keep trying, keep trying, mm -hmm. keep trying. Mm -hmm. um, so applying that smartly. And then uh, on the last one, I'll, I'll take my most dog-eared book on my bookshelf that I used to carry with me years ago. And I first discovered in, I think like late high school, early college, which is um, Marcus Aurelius Meditations. Mm. Um, I find that that is, uh, for me, that's just a, a wise step back in, um, un, you know, considering how one conducts our, our, uh, oneself inside of one's own mind uh, with respect to uh, going about daily life and, um, uh, you know, helps to, I think, take a step back and understand the big pers bigger perspective and work on oneself. Fantastic. So my last, I have a quick round of three questions. Well, you give a lot of advice, so maybe if you could summarize or if you have anything extra. What's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, someone in college, and a professional? Hmm. A high schooler, uh, I would say, hmm. Let me maybe start with college. And, and this might apply to, to high school too, but I was recently at the, the AI conference in San Francisco. I gave a talk there. And I walked out during a break just to get some sunshine. And there are three college students who pulled me aside and they're like, hey, can I interview you? And they just asked me a bunch of questions and uh, on, on video and like, you know, they're, I don't know where it landed. I haven't seen it, uh, but it doesn't matter. Like the, just the fact that they were out there and trying to learn what's happening out, outside the sphere of work uh, because the, the way the world works is really different from the way school works. And so just starting to take a, take a peek out there early on, um, I think is really cool um, and really important and can set you up for success. I would probably give the same advice to a high schooler. Um, you know, obviously do your homework and focus on the things you need to focus on because that's, that's all a foundation. But then, you know, if you're going to do more, look outside and see what's happening. You know, if you're interested in everyone's, uh, as software eats the world and graphs eat the world, everything's becoming, uh, you know, the technology is becoming an important part of people's jobs. Um, and I'd say for both high schoolers and those in college, um, most jobs that exist are going to involve becoming AI literate in some way and learning to become better at whatever it is you do with the assistance of, you know, not just the, you know, LLM chatbots, but all, all the other techniques and tools and so on that emerge. So I'd say getting, you know, making yourself a cyborg from that perspective, at least, you know, uh, becoming better at doing things uh, by understanding what those tools are and what you can use them for. Um, and I would say that applies post-college too. Probably 
a professional as well, right? We're all have to be cyborgs and yeah, <laughs> to a degree. Totally. I like that. Totally. That's another good shoot. You know, be, just become a cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've got three shirts going. <laughs> we got three shirts going. All right. So by rapid round of, of three questions. So you're stuck on an island. You have this specialized chef, and this place can cook anything that you want. They can fly in any ingredients. You're going to be stuck on this island for 10 years. You only get two meals. What two meals would you have that person make? Um, it would be Thai food. And then which dish? Hmm. Um, can probably pick anything. It's got to be spicy, mm -hmm. not too sweet, involves some vegetables. Uh Fine if it involves some meat too, okay. but yeah, I won't be too choosy if it's within that realm. So Thai, so Thai food. Oh, I'd say Thai food. food. Cool. What's one thing that brings you joy? Uh, oh, what brings me joy? Uh, discovering something new, mm. ma making a connection back to graphs. It's like c connecting ah, to okay. concepts or ideas that I hadn't previously connected. Mm -hmm. And. The last question I have is, is not thinking about being famous. Um, I think it's recognizing that the graph is not infinite, right? So and I think you'll appreciate it from a Marcus Aurelius meditations perspective. Hmm. Um, what do you want people to remember about you? About me, um, I think if there's anything I can do or offer that... Um, can in any way be useful i want to rem them to remember that useful thing like i don't mm. necessarily care that people remember me per se as Mar as marcus aurelius would point out like you know nobody remembers anyone's names after a few hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years um i think the who's the poet who wrote ozymandias was it shelley i don't know and i've never heard of that before I, yeah I it's like you know <laughs> yeah check it out that uh that speaks to the same idea okay perfect well philip i want to really thank you for coming on the show teaching us about graph rag sharing some of your perspectives on on leadership and product and being a cto and yeah looking forward to staying connected likewise thanks mark thanks all see ya bye